Today's episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream, an incredible and incredibly affordable place to watch thousands of non-fiction movies and shows. More on them in a bit. John Gotti was all smiles as he walked out through the doors of the courthouse, still a free man. It wasn't the first time that he'd beat the rap, and it wouldn't be the last. That's why people called him the Teflon Don, because no charges would stick to him. Outside the building, his adoring public was waiting for him. One of them enthusiastically shouted out, Queen says two world champions, the Mets, and John Gotti. John Gotti was more than just a successful mafia don. He changed the way that people regarded mob bosses. He never shied away from the spotlight or even tried to hide the fact that he was the most powerful criminal in New York City. He embraced this persona and became the first media don, always ready to pose for the camera in order to show off his new thousand dollar double breasted suit, his perfectly coiffed hair, or the beautiful lady hanging off his arm. John Gotti thought he was untouchable. He started out as a small-time gangster in Queens and rose up to become the head of the Gambino crime family, leaving a trail of dead bodies behind him that would make Macbeth blush. And this even included the previous boss, Paul Castellano, whom Gotti had murdered and still ended up with his nose clean, so it's not surprising that he thought nobody could mess with him. But you know how it goes. You're only untouchable until you're not. And that's a lesson that John Gotti learned the hard way. John Joseph Gotti Jr. was born on October 27, 1940, in South Bronx, the fifth of 13 children to second-generation Irish immigrants John and Franny Gotti. When he was a young child, his family moved around the city a lot, eventually settling in East New York in Brooklyn. Wherever he went, though, Gotti saw firsthand the wide reach of the Mafia. He didn't know who these guys were, but he saw that they had money and everyone treated them with fear and respect. For him, a poorly educated angry kid from an impoverished family, a life of crime soon became the only way he knew to a better future. One where he wasn't deadbeat, but also wasn't breaking his back 12 hours a day for some chicken feed. By the time he turned 12, John Gotti already had developed a reputation as a kid with a short temper and a pair of furious fists. Together with his brothers, he formed a gang that terrorized the neighborhood, and soon enough, they started running small errands for the wise guys that he so greatly admired. Gotti was nothing if not an overachiever, and he graduated pretty fast to more serious crimes such as robbery and larceny, although they didn't always go to plan. When he was 14, Gotti tried to steal a cement mixer from a construction site, except that it tipped over and crushed his toes, leaving him with a permanent limp. Education took a backseat in Gotti's life, and in 1956, he dropped out of school altogether. The following year, he was arrested for the first time for getting involved in a gang fight, but he was soon released without charge. A few months later, an unrelated but important event happened in his future home away from home. Albert Anastasia, head of one of the five New York crime families, was assassinated, and Carlo Gambino took over the family that now shared his name, assisted by his cousin, Paul Castellano. But these guys were all big shots. At this point, John Gotti was still a small-time crook who only operated two-bit rackets. But he was starting to meet the right people. He befriended a few future mobsters like Angelo Ruggiero and Willie Boyd Johnson. He was doing jobs for the Gambino family Capo, Carmine Fatico, and most important of all, he made the acquaintance of Aniello Della Croce, the future underboss of the Gambino family. In 1963, Gotti went to jail for the first time, except that it was only for a 20-day stretch for joyriding in a stolen car. Despite what his Teflon Don nickname might suggest, Gotti was not completely impervious to the occasional excursion behind bars. In fact, he received a more serious rap to close out the decade after being found guilty of hijacking some trucks at JFK International Airport. In 1969, Gotti was sentenced to three years at Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary, and when he got out in 1972, he went straight back to the Gambino gang. Even though the arrest cost Gotti three years of his life, ultimately it benefited him because it showed that he could do the time. Already some of his former running mates like the aforementioned Willy Boy had become informants for the FBI, so the old school bosses were always on the lookout for new guys who knew how to keep their mouths shut. In fact, when his direct boss Carmine Fatico got indicted for loan sharking, he appointed Gotti as the acting boss of their crew, who handled day-to-day -day operations. Now Gotti answered to Lella Croce, who saw some of himself in the young gangster and offered him guidance. Alas, the mentorship program didn't last long because Della Croce was hit with multiple charges and in the early 1970s was sentenced to five years in prison in 1973. But for Gotti, this meant that he now had to deal with the big boss himself, Don Carlo, the head of the Gambino family. Once again, 
again, this new arrangement was short-lived, because that same year, Gotti was indicted on a murder charge for shooting Irish-American mobster James McBratney. In 1975, he struck a deal and pled guilty to manslaughter and only served two years in a state prison. It was a short sentence, but those two years proved to be crucial, because while Gotti was incarcerated, Carlo Gambino died of natural causes, one of the few mob bosses to enjoy such a privilege, and many people, Gotti included, expected Aniello de la Croce to become the new boss. He was the underboss, after all. But that's not what happened. Instead, Gambino appointed Paul Castellano, aka Big Paulie, as the new head of the family, and with Della Croce still in prison at the time, he was hardly in an advantageous position to stake his claim. Therefore, he had no choice but to accept Castellano's succession, with Della Croce continuing to serve as underboss once he got out of prison. On the surface, the situation seemed settled, but as we all know, still waters run deep. There was a lot of tension in the Gambino family right now, with the gang effectively splitting into two factions, half loyal to Della Croce and half loyal to Big Paulie. It was only a matter of time before the situation would turn bloody. Now, just before we continue with today's video, look, you're a viewer of this channel. You're the sort of person who I bet likes to learn new things. Look, me too. It's one of the very reasons that we do this channel. And hey, if you want to take that learning further, then you should definitely check out the sponsor of today's video, Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream is a streaming service that isn't filled with low quality junk and reality TV shows. It's a collection of some of the best documentary and educational content from around the world. It's available on whatever devices you happen to have Roku to Apple TV to Chromecast. Plus, you can access it worldwide with no geo restrictions. Now, one of the neat things about Curiosity Stream is that in addition to their huge library of existing content, they're always adding cool new documentaries. I went and had a look at what they've recently released, and I added a bunch bunch to my watching queue. For example, there's this one with the most clickable title in the world, The Moon Landing and the Nazis, which looks at what role Nazi technology had in the journey to the moon. Look, we've covered a lot of Nazis on this channel and the crazy things that they had cooking wild inventions wise, and this documentary does a deep dive on some of that technology. This is just one random example of the cool stuff that's being added all the time. So go to curiositystream.com slash biographics for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and non-fiction series. And for you guys, you can use the promo code biographics and you'll save 25%, which makes it only $14.99 a year, which is just $1.25 a month. Incredible deal. Thanks to Curiosity Stream for sponsoring. And now back to today's video. Even though Della Croce was not the new Don, he still had plenty of sway, so unsurprisingly, once Gotti was out of prison in 1977, Della Croce made sure that his former protege was treated right. First, he got made alongside his brother, Gene, and friend Angelo Ruggieri, and then was named as the new captain of Fatico's former crew, becoming one of Della Croce's top earners. Now that John Gotti was part of the upper levels of the Mafia hierarchy, he took a step back from riskier crimes such as robberies and hijackings and instead focused on the traditional mob go-tos such as loan sharking, racketeering, and gambling. But he was still a violent man who did not hesitate to get his hands dirty whenever the situation called for it. In 1979, he made oh, one of only a handful of flights in his entire life to travel to the Tropicana Hotel in Miami Beach, Florida to deal with a loan shark who was posing a problem for Della Croce. Whatever happens to that guy, we don't know. We just assume it was something extremely unpleasant because he simply disappeared one day. And he was definitely not the only man in Gotti's life to just vanish without a trace. In 1980, a personal tragedy struck the Gotti household when the mob captain's 12-year-old son, Frank Gotti, was run over and killed by a driver. The culprit was a neighbor named John Favara, and he too disappeared off the face of the earth a few months later, while John Gotti and his wife Victoria were away on a convenient alibi-providing trip to Florida. During the 1980s, the rift between the two sides of the Gambino family grew wider. Many of the men did not respect Big Paulie and questioned his leadership skills, resenting the fact that he never made his bones out on the street. For his part, Castellano did little to change their perceptions, instead preferring to lock himself up in his lavish mansion on Tot Hill in Staten Island and dealing only with a select few underlings. These same men derisively referred to Castellano as the Pope because you needed a summons in order to see him. And we weren't just talking about guys loyal to Della Croce here. Even some of Paulie's own guys were starting to doubt him, including notorious Gambino soldier Sammy the Bull Gravano and Big Paul's own consigliere Joseph Gallo. With that kind of resistance, it was fair to say that Castellano's time at the top would inevitably come to an end sooner or later. 
With his back against the ropes, Big Paulie tried to play nice with Delacroce. He knew that he was dealing with an old, frail man who was on his way out, and he tried to make good by promising him that if Big Paulie went to jail, he would name Gotti as one of the three street bosses who would act in his stead, alongside Tommy Gambino, Carlo's son, and Tommy Bilotti, Paul's favorite capo. This attempts at mending fences actually infuriated Gotti more than anything else. He saw Tommy Gambino simply as Carlo's spoiled rich son and Bellotti as Big Paulie's yes man. Neither one was fit to run the family. Gotti became convinced now more than ever that Castellano had to go. But taking out a boss wasn't something you could just do on a whim. Gotti had to make sure that he had the support to take over the family, otherwise he would be taking a dirt nap right next to Castellano. He reached out to some key members of Paulie's crew, Sammy the Bull, Frank DeSico, Robert D.B. DiBernardo, and Joseph Armone. Alongside Gotti himself, they had the makings of a secret conspiracy, and they even had a name for themselves. The Fist. After they sorted out the issues within the family, they reached out to a few important members of the other families in New York, Lucchesi, Colombo, and Bonanno, and found men who would be amenable if some unfortunate accident were to befall Big Paulie. All except the Genovese, since they were led by Vincent the Chin Gigante, a close friend and business partner of Paul Castellano for decades. On November 2, 1985, Della Croce died of cancer. Foolishly, Castellano thought this represented the golden opportunity for him to neuter Gotti's power without resorting to violence. Violence. He immediately ignored the promises he made, named Tommy Bellotti as his sole underboss, and disbanded Gotti's crew, spreading his men around the family. He even skipped Delacroce's wake out of fear of police surveillance, a disrespectful breach of etiquette that represented the last straw for Gotti. Less than two weeks later, Gotti replied in full force. On the evening of December the 16th, Castellano and Bellotti were driving to Spark Steakhouse in Midtown Manhattan for a meeting. The restaurant had just been named the best steakhouse in the city by New York Magazine, so Big Paulie was probably looking forward to a really nice dinner. About a dozen men were eagerly awaiting his arrival, but they had ill intentions in mind. Four of them were shooters, shuffling around outside the restaurant, trying to mingle with the Christmas crowd. Another six or so were backup shooters and getaway drivers waiting in their cars. And last but not least, there were two more men sitting in a black Lincoln in a secluded spot, getting ready to watch the show. These were Sammy Gravano and John Gotti. Truth be told, this uh, was a bit of overkill, because Big Paulie never had a chance of escaping the ambush. As soon as Bellotti pulled up in front of Sparks and Castellano started getting out of the car, six guns were pointed at his head, and they all opened fire. The other two were for Bellotti. As the shooters disappeared into the night in their getaway vehicles, Gotti cruised by the crime scene so he could admire his handiwork. The boss was dead. John Gotti had just done the unthinkable. He organized an unsanctioned hit on a New York family boss. The last time this had happened had been almost 30 years earlier, back in 1957, when Vito Genovese and Carlo Gambino led a failed assassination attempt against Frank Costello, followed by a hit against Albert Anastasia, which was met with far more success. But Genovese and Gambino were the de facto leaders of the two most powerful crime families in New York. Gotti was just a capo. Surely he couldn't get away with it, right? First on his to-do list was to get his own house in order. This started immediately following the hit on Big Paulie. One of the capos who were loyal to Gotti, Frank DeSico, met with some of the other capos, including Tommy Gambino and James Failure, that same night and gave them the new lay of the land. Paul Castellano was dead. So was Tommy Bellotti, but nobody else was going to get hurt. That was all that needed to be said. If nothing else, mobsters have always been adept at conveying messages with an economy of words that would make Hemingway proud. Fela and Gambino were Castellano loyalists, but they understood that Gotti had Big Paulie whacked and was making a play for the leadership position. If they interfered, then obviously what happened to Paulie could happen to them. It's not like they were in a position to argue at the time, so they simply agreed and went home. The public reacted to the assassination with shock and dismay, but at the same time couldn't look away, like the scene of a gruesome car crash. As we said, it had been decades since the New York mob had been rocked by such a brazen act of violence and disobedience, and the media were more than happy to fan the flames. Since both the NYPD and the FBI kept Gotti under tight surveillance, it wasn't hard for the newsmen to lean on their sources and put out the story that the crimes were part of John Gotti's plan to become the new boss of the Gambino family. But it wasn't just Gotti's actions that made for good print, it was John Gotti himself. He was a lot younger than the other Dons. He was in his mid-40s when he killed Castellano, while the other bosses were all eligible for senior citizen discounts. Paulie himself was 70 when he bit the big one. 
Words like youthful and dashing were often used to describe Gotti to the man's great pleasure, as most news outlets were already proclaiming him the new boss. Since then, he always made sure to look his best whenever he was out in public, and just like that, the Dapper Don was born. Two days after the hit on Big Paulie, a meeting took place at a restaurant owned by Sammy the Bull. Gotti was there, and so were almost all the other Carpos in the Gambino family. Even though they were theoretically still investigating what had happened to Castellano, it became clear to everyone in the room that John Gotti left the building as the new boss of the Gambino crime family, with Frank DeSico acting as his underboss. But then there was the little matter of the other four families. Three of them were pretty cool with it, as long as Gotti never openly admitted what he did, since it was, after all, a serious violation of commission rules, but the Genovese family was a problem. It was led by Vincent Gigante, who had been not only a longtime friend of Paul Castellano, but also a frequent business partner, which meant that Gotti's actions cost him money, and he wasn't about to let him get away with it. The retaliation came on April the 16th, 1986, when Gotti and DeSico were supposed to meet one of their capos at his club in Bensonhurst. While everyone was inside, a hitman working for Gigante placed a bomb under DeSico's Buick Electra. Then, when the two men came outside and entered the car, the bomb went off, killing both of them. But here's the rub. Neither man was John Gotti. Unbeknownst to the hitmen, Gotti got detained earlier and never arrived at the club, so DeSico went alone. The other guy in the car with him was an unlucky gangster who only joined DeSico to retrieve the business card for a lawyer from his glove compartment. The good luck continued for Gotti as Gigante arranged another hit with two gunmen from New Jersey. However, they got a bit too chatty on a phone line that had been bugged by the feds, so the authorities stepped in and arrested them before they were able to carry out the murder. After two failed attempts, Gigante relented and accepted Gotti's new position. After all, it's not like he was a stranger to breaking commission rules. Three decades earlier, he had been the one who carried out the unsanctioned and unsuccessful hit on Frank Costello. Even though Gotti's position with the other families might have been squared, he was still feeling the heat from the law as he was dealing with several cases pending against him. First was a felony assault beef on a refrigerator repairman named Romuald Pietzek. Poor Pietzek went to the police and even identified Gotti as his attacker, but back then he had no idea who he was IDing. Once he realized the grave mistake that he had just made, Pietzek refused to testify against Gotti. One down. Want to go. The other case pending against Gotti was more serious. It was a RICO case, which stood for Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations, an act that had been passed specifically to target the big wigs of the mafia. However, Gotti had an ace up his sleeve. One of the jurors, George Pape, was on his payroll, so at worst, he was going to get a mistrial. But Pape managed to convince the other jurors that doing their civic duty wasn't worth the threat posed by Gotti to them and their families. After a seven-month-long trial, the verdict was in. Not guilty, as the crowds both inside and outside the courtroom started applauding and cheering. At a time when the government was actually putting a serious dent in the mob's activities, Gotti's acquittals were two rare defeats for them, hence the mobster's new moniker in the media, the Teflon Don. But although John Gotti seemed untouchable, the same couldn't be said for the men around him. First, his underboss, Frank DeSico, was killed with the car bomb intended for him. Robert D.B. DiBernardo was killed in 86 on Gotti's orders, while Angelo Ruggiero died of cancer in 89. Meanwhile, John Gotti's brother, Gene, his consigliere, Joseph Gallo, and his second underboss, Joseph Armone, were all convicted of various crimes and sent to prison in the late 1980s. With nobody else left, Gotti made Sammy the Bull Gravano his new underboss. This turned out to be the biggest mistake of his life. In 1990, Gotti was arrested again on numerous counts of racketeering, murder, extortion, jury tampering, and whatever else the district attorney could throw at him. The FBI and NYPD worked closely to build an airtight case against him. The judge ordered the jurors to be kept anonymous. Everyone wanted to take down the Teflon Don. Despite all of this, John Gotti remained hopeful. After all, earlier that same year, he had been acquitted in yet another case, that time for assault and conspiracy. He was 3-0 against the government ever since he took control of the Gambino family, so he had no reason to think that this time would be any different. But then his heart sank as he saw on the witness stand none other than his right-hand man, Sammy the Bull. Gravano had turned state's witness against his former boss and had accepted witness protection in exchange for revealing where all the bodies were buried. Sometimes quite literally. Sammy the Bull admitted to playing a role in 19 killings and implicated his boss in several of them, plus all the other dirt that he had on him. Back then, this was the highest-ranking desertion in the Mafia's 
history, the second in command of the most powerful of New York's five families. Apparently, Gravano had been persuaded to become an informant after the feds showed him surveillance footage of Gotti making disparaging remarks about him and even floating the idea of letting him take the fall for some of Gotti's own crimes. There was no escaping this time. With all the evidence gathered by the authorities and with Gravano's testimony, John Gotti was found guilty of all charges and sentenced to life in prison in June 1992. He never ceded his position as head of the Gambino family, instead preferring to relay his orders through his son, John A. Gotti, and his brother, Peter, who both served as acting boss. Losses. He spent 10 years in jail before dying of throat cancer on June 10, 2002. When he was finally found guilty, the head of the FBI's New York office proudly proclaimed, The Teflon is gone. The Don is covered in Velcro, and all the charges stuck.